Hello, my name is uh, Julio Santos, and I'm the technical co-founder of Fractal. We are hard at work building the Fractal protocol, which will enable radical markets for data and help keep the web open and free for everyone. Joining me today is Torsten Dittma. He's a founder and CEO at PolyPoly. Poly. His work has been a source of inspiration for us, and I'm very grateful that Torsten took the time to join us today. Torsten, could you tell us a bit about your story and what moved you to uh, focus on privacy tech? Yes, first of all, thanks for the invite. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I started with computers um, when the hacker scene came up. Um, and so, you know, privacy and all that stuff was a part of my history anyway. Um, and um, so, and when I got in touch with this whole story about Cambridge Analytica and so on and so forth, uh, I was really, really shocked what's going on. And so it is, I guess, up to us as tech guys to fix that because basically we have caused that problem uh, you know, without uh, programmers uh, building uh, these kind of systems which are currently harming our private sphere, there would be not these kind of problems. So uh, it is also up to us to fix it. I agree. That's a uh, that's a really interesting perspective, and a lot of folks don't take responsibility for what we're helping to create. <laughs> so I really agree with you. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about PolyPoly. Poly. So when did you start it, and what have you guys built so far? What can people already do with it? Mm -hmm. um, so the research started around about oh my god five, six years ago. Um, and uh, that was a maybe a little bit untypical for a startup, but uh, we did basically the whole research upfront uh, and uh, before we founded the company. So basically the uh, founding the company that was at uh, the May the 4th uh, in uh, 2019, <laughs> um, uh, that was basically our, um, the, the main message we sent there was, we know how to fix it right now. So we tried everything upfront. We had a lot of lots of discussions with lawyers, uh, with uh, people from um, you know different kinds of businesses, um, how to fix this issue because this is basically not only a technical problem. You know, this whole data privacy stuff is partly a technical problem. Partly, um, it has to do with economic incentives. It has to do with uh, you know laws and and so on and so forth. So it's a multi-dimensional problem, and um, so there is no multi-dimensional solution needed. Um, and that was basically what we tried to find out upfront um, how that can be done. Um, and um, so what we did so far um, is. Um, yeah, as I said, it's a multi-dimensional problem. So uh, one aspect uh, was, uh, of course, how to build a company uh, that cannot be taken over, um, how to build uh, uh, um, say, um, uh, a jurisdictional or law-based um, system um, that is so rock solid that uh, nobody can, can really harm it. Um, um, and then, of course, um, uh, what we also did is the first prototype um, or the first version um, of the Polypod, which is one of our systems, and the first version of the Polypedia, which is the second one. Um, so what you can do with the Polypod today, if you download it today, um, it is basically looking behind the scenes of the data economy. So um, the Polypod, which is out there today, is a front end for the Polypedia, and the Polypedia is a system uh, where we are storing all information about companies who are acting in the data economy. So um, their net company network behind Google, so who's owning whom, um, then are also in which jurisdictions they're settled. So basically all these company house data um, and uh, also their um, data behavior of these companies. So what kind of uh, data they are gathering how they are using it, but it is all based on, let me say, as a general perspective. It's not based mm -hmm. on your personal data, um, because we said there are, you know, one of the most important um, aspects in that kind of um, ecosystem is trust, and trust is something you have to earn. Um, and so we said, okay, the first um, iteration we will make uh, cannot harm you at all because none of your personal data is involved. We will show you that we're knowing what we are talking about. Um, and then the second version, which is uh, coming up very soon, is then uh, about downloading your data from Facebook 
uh, and bringing that in the context um, uh, with the data that is stored in the polyteer about Facebook. Um, this is I'm basically building that kind of relationship, showing you, okay, if you're in Germany, means you have a contract with Facebook Island, means um, <clears throat> um, these are kind of laws are in charge for you, saying, okay, this is your data you have currently stored at Facebook. What does it exactly mean for example, for example, for a picture? That's super um, interesting. So it's kind of like a mapping between like, uh, so here's your data, here's who own it, here's who else can see it, and here's the your rights and uh, based on what regulation, based on where you are, it's a whole map of what's going on. Right. Um, so, you know, GDPR, or as in Germany, it's called uh, the, um, uh, DSGVO, uh, the Datenschutzgrundverordnung, um, is a right you have, but it's not easy to execute. Um, and um, a law or a right you have which you cannot execute is no right. Um, and um, so we have to make it easier for people to understand what's what's going you know, what's going on with their data. Um, so why can it be harmful that somebody knows your um, uh, location data? You know, um, I guess one of the biggest problems we have in the whole data economy is that um, that for you know, people who have not studied computer science, um, um, it is a completely abstract uh, threat model. Uh, nobody can really understand what it means uh, when somebody knows my um, location data or you know what what can be done with pictures. Yeah? So, for example, that um, you know, if you are posting a picture. Um, that this picture can be used um, to find out uh, what kind of uh, um, trademarks you are using. So, you know, it is a boss t-shirt or is it uh, um, uh, um, you know, furniture from Ikea or whatsoever that is then giving you some or giving these people hints how many money you're earning and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, all this stuff is very intransparent nowadays. That's something we have to explain. Yeah, I agree. Education is extremely important. It's the only way that we get to make people aware of what it is that is going on, because if they're going yeah. to have an impact, if they're going to have a voice, they first need to understand this, this landscape. And it's deliberately opaque, so it's not exactly easy to understand without help. Um, thank you for that, Torsten. Um, I, I have uh, I've seen that Poly Poly is made up with of uh, three uh, linked organizations. So you've got the cooperative, the enterprise, and the and the foundation. Um, can you give us an overview of uh, why yeah. these three organizations and what the relationship between them is? Of course. Um, so um, the one of the um, so the foundation is basically there to build co-ops. Um, so the co-op we currently have is a so-called SCE, that's a new legal body in Europe. Um, and um, that means this is a pan-European uh, uh, cooperative. Um, and uh, you can only get a member of this co-op if you are a European citizen. Um, this has a very simple reason. Um, if you have foreigners as members, uh, especially, for example, if you have US citizens um, as a member um, of a European co-op, it can happen to that co-op that they will be in front of a court in uh, New York City um, uh, a day later. So um, <clears throat> the um, the co-ops are acting um, like a legal um, fortress, let me say, um, for um, the local citizens. So uh, that means we have to build sooner or later uh, co-ops in other uh, parts of the world. Uh, so we are currently in discussion with people from Canada, from US and India to build co-op there. And that's basically the rule of the foundation to build these co-ops everywhere. Um, and so it's basically a kind of an incubator for local co-ops. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, the important aspect of keeping co-ops local uh, is, is very simple, basically two things. Um, one is making sure that in the data economy, taxes will be paid local. Um, so that uh, when something, um, or when with your data, uh, when your data is used to generate money for you, um, then these taxes should be paid in your community and not somewhere else. Um, and um, secondly, um, for you as a, a local citizen, only your law should be in charge. You know, even if I have a contract with somebody else, you know, it is for um, 
non-business people already difficult enough to understand contracts in their own language and in their own uh, home country. Um, but international law is uh, something that is unhandable uh, for uh, normal citizens. So we, we have to make sure that everything will happen locally. Locally, um, and that's the reason why uh, we have the foundation um, and uh, the co-ops um, in all the different countries. Ah, okay, um, that makes it a lot clearer. Like I was looking at uh, your website, and I believe now I was looking at the cooperative website, and it's very, very Europe-centric. And I was going to ask why, and I guess the answer is well, it's what we're starting with, right? It's the first co-op. Yes, it is the first one. Uh, it is made out of, uh, for Europeans, um, uh, but nevertheless their data economy market is global. Um, so um, uh, that means we have to build um, other co-ops, um, which is then, and these co-ops will be then owned by our citizens in these state only or in these countries. So it means the, uh, the co-op is 100% owned by the users, uh, by the local users um, and taking care of their rights, um, taking care of their opinion, saying, okay, you know, uh, if the European users want to go in that direction, but the Americans want to go in that direction. Okay, you know, that's fine. Uh, you know, that is, we, be, we are not so arrogant saying that what we think what is right in Europe uh, is right for every other country. Uh, we had this problem in the past, so we should not go the <laughs> same way again. Um, and so that um, all the local co-ops have our, um, the opportunity to adapt these system um, to the local culture, culture to the local law, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But the, the interfaces are still the same, um, so that a, a company who wants to use these uh, decentralized data network uh, will find a, a global uh, network um, of um, you know uh, interfaces or or pods which are using exactly the same interface, um, but um, um, always with a local adaptation. Um, and um, so the, the enterprise, um, you know, the, the co-ops are for the users. Uh, the enterprise, um, there is no data economy without economy, so no surprise, <laughs> the enterprise is serving the economy. Um, so building tools um, for the economy so that they will uh, find an easy way from a centralized data economy to a decentralized data economy. Understood. And that means also we have these two different fundraising streams. You know, the enterprise is financed by um, the economy, um, and uh, the co-op is basically financed by the users. Um, so if you just imagine, we have nowadays, I guess, uh, some hundred million um, Facebook users uh, in Europe. I heard something about 400 million. Sounds a bit big that number, but nevertheless, but, um, you know, if just one percent of these Europeans. Um, would join uh, the European co-op uh, and just buy one share, that would be a bunch of money. Um, and um, so these companies then completely owned by the users, financed by the users, uh, uh, founded by the users uh, and funded by the users. And um, on the other hand, uh, we have for, you know the, the enterprise, which is um, responsible for the economy and also financed by the economy. Understood. Um, so the uh, you talk a lot about uh, data unions, and um, that's what a co-op is in this in this context, right? Um, in some ways, yes. do you think that there is room for there to be? So uh, you're already thinking of uh, more than one co-op, right? So you've got the European co-op, and then maybe you have the American co-op. Do you think that there is room for multiple European cooperatives in, in which they they compete uh, for for user attention by saying, "Hey, this is how we handle your data. We do a little bit differently," and then you aggregate people based on these preferences, for example. Yeah, uh, for sure. Competition is a, a very important part of our uh, economic system. So um, yes, of course, there should be and there is uh, competition. Um, I guess the only thing that is very important here is that interoperability um, is, is always in place here. You know? So um, there is this uh, awesome organization uh, called My Data Global, mm -hmm. um, which is um, acting like a um, how can I say they are building standards for how to handle um, um, personal data um, and there are already, already a lot of companies um, are part of that organization uh, and all of them have signed um, that uh, they will make sure that it is very easy for the user to transfer data from one uh, potential solution to the next one. Um, so I guess that's um, um, that's a very important aspect because you know you never know which solution is really the right one. Um, 
and um, because markets are very dynamic and uh, even with you know lots of uh, awesome brains and and whatsoever you can come up with a awesome solution nobody wants to have. Um, so um, it is very, very important that there are lots of different players trying lots of different ideas. Um, and then um, the user uh, will decide what is the right one for uh, him or her. Yeah, with a commitment to interoperability, you, you allow those things to happen, right? Like you, you're saying as a company, hey, we believe that we have the solution for this, but we might not. So might as well, you know, like play around with other folks and perhaps the solution is us plus somebody else. Or so this interoperability, this portability of data becomes really important. Yeah, for us, that's, that's um, <clears throat> of course, you know, the, the polypod on its own is more a platform than anything else. So um, what we would like to be in the future is something like a public water supply for data. Um, so means we are taking care um, you know, of, of, of the pipes in the earth. Uh, we are taking care of that everything what's in that pipes is clear water. Uh, and then others um, can use our infrastructure uh, to make business uh, with that one. So for example, when it comes to um, um, health data, you know, we are not an expert in health data. Uh, we are an expert for decentralized data systems um, and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, there are experts out there uh, who maybe would like to do uh, a decentralized uh, um, uh, solution, uh, but have no clue how to build these kind of technology. Um, and um, so our role is then saying, okay, we will build the underlying infrastructure and everybody else can sit on top and um, you know, interact with the user um, and make business and whatsoever. Um, so, <clears throat> that's that's basically the idea of the polypod. It is extendable. Everybody can build features for the polypod, also third parties, um, and um, and so then um, people can start building things uh, on top of the polypod. Um, and if the user wants to have it, he can just download that feature um, and um, use it, or even not. It depends on uh, if the user likes that feature, trusts this uh, supplier, um, and um, that's um, how it works. Got it. Uh, I, uh, I like your focus on, on infrastructure. It's similar to ours uh, and um, it's, uh, it's close to my heart. <laughs> with, with, with this approach that you took with the, with the polypod, um, actually the, the polypod stores data in, in the edge, right? Yes. All right, so that's that's a very similar approach to what Fractal is taking, or it's the same approach to what Fractal is taking. Um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a, an opportunity to look into that quite soon. I'm curious to understand uh, how you think that compares to uh, to Solid's alternative, for example. Like there, there are pods that, that live in the cloud instead. Yeah, um, so um, there's one move or one part of this whole data privacy movement is about data wallets, let's say. Uh, and the other one, uh, and solid as a part of that one is about um, computation or, or doing um, or using algorithms and all that stuff close to your data. Um, so instead of sending it somewhere else, uh, the, the algorithm is uh, done locally. So the project of Tim Burns, we so the solid pod is from my point of view, it is an awesome project. I really love our, uh, the solid project. Um, beside of one aspect. Um, and this aspect is that it, it happens in the cloud. Um, so what means the cloud? The cloud means nothing else than a computer of somebody else. Um, and um, so from my point of view, you should not trust anybody uh, in the internet. Um, and um, so if what does it mean for a user who has no technical background? If something is running somewhere else, it's basically you know, out of my control completely. Um, so if you try to, to try to find a metaphor for that in the real world. Um, so that means some of my memories, some of my emotions um, <clears throat> are not part of my brain anymore, or you know, some of my um, um, you know, emotional uh, pictures I have are not at home anymore. They are somewhere else. Um, and somewhere else, um, something is happening with these things. Um, in the analog world, would we do something like that? Of course not. No. It, it, it feels completely weird. Yeah? Um, and um, uh, there is no, no external storage for my emotions or my memories. Yeah? It is always in my brain. Um, it's always local. 
Um, and uh, but nevertheless, this idea of you know having local computation or local in the meaning of close to my data, that is something what from our point of view is an awesome idea. And that's basically also what we are doing at Poly Poly. Um, it you know long term, it is about stop sharing data, start sharing algorithms, so that the algorithms are coming to my data. Um, to, down to my local device that there will be computed there and just the results are going back. Um, the other uh, part of the movement is about data wallets saying, okay, I have one place uh, on my device um, and um, so all, you know, and I'm trying to get all the data from all, all, all the different places down to my data wallet. Uh, and from there, I'm then managing to whom I'm sharing uh, what kind of data. Um, <clears throat> that's also a good idea. Um, as I said, you know, lo to have things local is, uh, from my point of view, really a good idea. Um, and um, but the, the 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 problem with data wallets um, is um, still, um, you know, I have to share my data. Um, so if it is very sensible data, and I don't feel well with sharing that, that means um, you know nothing can happen with this data with this data. But high quality data um, also having access to a lot of sensible data is very important for fixing some of our core problems in, in the future you know the climate stuff and so on and so forth some health things uh, so um, we must build something uh, where people are willing to give access um, to these kind of information uh, because they can be 100 percent sure that it cannot be misused so when I when I have a data wallet and there is some somebody on the other uh, side of their um, <clears throat> of the internet who wants to use it, maybe I'm trusting that person. Um, but you know, nevertheless, um, when lots of data are coming from lots of different users are coming together at one place, it's like Fort Knox. It really makes sense um, to hack that system. We saw that in Finland. We had uh, um, there was a, a really really awesome group of people uh, trying to um, to build a system uh, for health data uh, for very, very good reasons, with very good intents. Um, and these folks were hacked. Um, and uh, then, uh, uh, so as you say so, but an yeah. SO basically misused the data um, to get money from that uh, uh, local user saying, hey, if you don't give me that money, I will publish that you have a mental health problem. Um, so yeah, a honeypot will always be a honeypot, right? Yes, um, and that's you know the the problem with pure data wallets. You know the computation has always to happen somewhere else, and that means these somewhere else is always a honeypot. Um, you know, and even if it's a hundred percent secure, some company controls it today. Who is going to control it tomorrow, right? Like you, you don't know. Once data is copied, yeah. it's copied. That's that's yeah. It. Yeah, I had their, um, a funny discussion with one of the uh, lawyers from Facebook uh, some months ago uh, in a public hearing. Um, and um, I, I was asking him uh, what will happen uh, when uh, Facebook gets bankrupt. Um, and uh, he was uh, smiling and said, we will never get back. Ah, and then I asked him, okay, <laughs> if this will be the case, you will not have any problem to sign me that piece of paper where you are guaranteeing that when your company is going under chapter 11, that you will never sell the data of your, uh, of your customers. And of course he was not signing that paper. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, you never know what happens tomorrow. Yeah? And that's the reason why in the real world, <clears throat> um, we are very careful with uh, what kind of information we are sharing with who. Um, there's a very nice research saying um, sharing uh, or you know, sharing information between friends uh, is like Cold War. Um, you know, if I'm handing something very um, sensible to you, uh, you have to hand something uh, very sensible. Uh, you have to send something to me very sensible. Um, so I guess Mark Zuckerberg will know, know a lot about uh, us, uh, lots of uh, uh, sensible information. I don't know how many sensible information we have about Facebook or uh, the chief of Facebook. So that's a very unbalanced situation. It's completely yeah? asymmetrical. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Understood. I, uh, um, uh, I think it's really interesting that you're going, uh, maybe, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm understanding it wrong, like you, the, once the, poly, the polypod starts making data accessible, you will immediately be with this compute to data approach, so data will never be, uh, leave the polypod in plain text, is that what you're saying? 
Um, you can use or Polyfall will you do as both? data wallet. So you can send data ah, somewhere okay. else. Um, but um, that's second class, uh, I would say. But it is maybe something, uh, let me say, a bridge technology. Um, so, by, but, um, you know, for example, if you want to, um, to manage a fleet of shared cars, um, you would like to know uh, what's the schedule um, of the citizens uh, tomorrow uh, when they uh, will leave their home, going to the office, and so on and so forth? Um, so one way to do so is that all the the locals will, um, you know, expose these kind of sensible data. Uh, most likely, they are not willing to. Um, the other way is saying, "Hey, um, I'm sending an untrained model uh, to a federated AI platform, uh, and then during the night, um, you know." these uh, network out of millions millions of pods uh, will train that model so that early in the morning, uh, um, a well-trained model is there for you know, handling the fleet of a, a car sharer. Um, and and um, you will have a better commute to work. Totally agree. And that also means um, um, you're saving a lot of IT OPEX. Yeah? Um, um, and you, you don't have uh, um, so huge IT risks, so hacking and all that stuff. Um, because everything is done then locally. Yeah, so um, I, I agree. Um, who, who vets these algorithms? So these these models, these uh, these computation tools that are sent to to the edge, sent to the user devices. How does the user know that they can trust them? Is there a vetting process? Who is involved in that? Um, so um, this is something we will bring live. Uh, I would say begin of next year. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what? Company, the, the, the name is uh, Feature Depot uh, or Poly Depot. Um, so it is a little bit like a, an app store, um, a little bit like. Um, it's not really an app store because the things we are talking about are much, much smaller. Um, and basically, everybody can open such a kind of um, um, feature depot. Um, so, you know, for example, an NGO like uh, the Cars Computer Club or whomever. Um, uh, can open such a kind of thing um, and um, they can certify um, their features which are stored in that depot. Um, so if you're trusting, for example, um, you know, these kind of NGO more than us or, or more than, I don't know, maybe a government will do something like that as well, um, <clears throat> then um, it, you can go to this uh, depot and download the features from there. Um, and uh, But also companies like, I don't know, huge are uh, B2C companies like maybe Adidas or whomever can build something like that, saying, hey, all, all the, the features this has to do with our products are stored here. Um, so, um, you know, uh, um, earlier in the talk, uh, uh, we had that aspect of, of trust um, mm -hmm. and uh, education. So, beside of, um, you know, educate people, there's another ingredient needed to you know, make our data economy understandable for uh, non-tech people. Um, and one important aspect here is that trust should work like trust is working in the analog world. Currently, the, uh, trust, the trust mechanisms we have in the digital world are working completely different um, than our, how it works in the reality. So first of all, trust is normally uh, zero or one. You know, if you have a certificate for your HTTPS connection, you trust it or not. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the certificate is normally made by somebody you have never heard about. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? For, it just comes uh, pre-installed in your browser and you're like, yeah, oh, okay. Um, so basically <laughs> it means nothing. Um, and um, it is always global and trust um, for normal human beings are always subjective. So saying, you know, me personally, for example, I'm uh, I'm using an uh, insurance company for a very simple reason, because my mom said 30 years ago, go there. And I trust my mom when it comes to money. <laughs> so um, that's the reason why I'm, you know, uh, why I'm using that kind of insurance company. So when it comes to other aspects, I know people uh, around me who know, who have more knowledge or whatsoever. So they're influencing my own trust. Um, and that's the way how we are building trust in, um, in poly poly or in the polypod as well is subjective. Um, so that means my trust, my personal trust in a company, in a feature developer, or in somebody who wants to use my data or in another person 
is always subjective. It is my personal trust and I will be influenced by others because uh, people, companies, organizations uh, can publish their trust patterns. They can say, hey, I, I trust this one. And then I can subscribe that. Um, and this is then influencing my trust. Um, so um, means um, if I would install uh, a feature, maybe you will build one or uh, in the future, um, depends highly on my personal trust, but also on you know, other organizations or friends um, which are trusting you, which maybe have, have an awesome experience with your product and so on and so forth and say, hey, I really like that one, really good. So the ranking of features is not depending on AdWords anymore. Um, it's you know, the ranking of features uh, when you're searching for a feature is based on your personal trust uh, and your personal influence sphere, let me say. Um, and um, for example, um, that also means that, you know, a government like the uh, Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informatik, so the German uh, government who is uh, responsible for uh, secure IT systems, um, they can publish uh, trust patterns saying, hey, you know, we had a look on these and these features, maybe for example, for features who are downloading data from governments, yeah, because um, GDPR is also relevant when it comes to saying, hey, uh, you know, text uh, uh, government, please send me your data about me. Um, so then the, these folks can say, hey, you know, we trusting this feature or that one or this company. Um, and that means as well, um, if somebody is running crazy or is sold to, her, uh, um, to, a, to another company, uh, which is, um, you know, maybe influenced by states, you know, which do are crazy, crazy things or whatsoever, then they can say, hey, we don't trust them anymore. And these will have an immediate impact uh, on the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, because right. trust is something that happens real time. Um, so yeah, understood. how we think that they're, you know, importing working me mechanisms from the real world to the digital world is always a good idea. Understood. Thank you, Tostin. I've got a I've got a related question to how your privacy is also connected to other people's privacy. Um, something that we've uh, we started to realize is that the the concept of personal data is sometimes a little bit blurry, because often data that's about you is also about someone else. So, for example, if you and I are known to spend time together, and I'm sharing my location, but you're not, then I am in a way violating your privacy. Now, we're working on a concept of uh, privacy preserving data sharing. Uh, and, and one of the ways that we can make that work is by grouping users in different cohorts or different unions based on these privacy preferences to make sure that these externalities aren't randomly placed on people who aren't ready to accept them. So I wanted to know if you have any thoughts on this, on this idea that uh, personal data, sometimes it's a bit blurry and it applies to just more than you. And if PolyPoly Poly has taken this into account in, in, in any way. So Again, I guess that's that's very fascinating. Um, that's a very old-fashioned problem. You know, we had that in the analog world uh, also with you know pictures, you know analog pictures. Um, so uh, when uh, somebody made a picture with the two of us, um, so it's exactly the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, so and there are laws for that in place. Um, so and. If you implement the laws exactly that way, it's a different story, but at least you can take them as an inspiration. Um, so um, try to find out how that works in the real world is again here a good idea because that is something that people, you know, let me say that is a learned pattern. They know these kind of behaviors. So we as tech guys should not try to implement something that's better than the real world. Um, first of all, we should try to implement something that is as the real world, because then it's easy to understand for human beings. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, you're totally right. Um, there is this aspect of, uh, uh, you know, is it my data, your data, or our data? Um, and um, the the um, there's a, an awesome uh, protocol called ODRL. Um, um, that's about uh, you know how to model um, rights for digital asset. It, mm -hmm. asset. it was originally made uh, for DRM management. Um, so you have an asset, um, and this asset is always coming along with a policy, and that policy uh, includes basically um, you know what what you're allowed to do, what is forbidden, and what kind of duties are coming with these asset. Um, and basically what 
uh, what you just said is about these duties saying okay you know if you are sharing your um, uh, location and this is close to my location or in some way related um, then um, you are only allowed to do so uh, if you are fulfilling that kind of duties um, and um, that's how uh, but at the end of the day that's something that is you know if it is your location or my location we should find a way um, how we want to do that it, uh, because uh, the way how we want to do it is maybe a different one than others yeah. uh, would like to do it um, so there cannot be a static solution for something like that it is basically making people aware of hey if he's sharing his location that means uh, as long as we are in a meeting together uh, he will share my location as well so your sis or the, the system who's taking care of your privacy sphere uh, should be aware um, that I'm close to you um, and then sending a notification before you are able to share your location. Is that okay? Um, and if I'm saying yes, fine. Uh, and if I'm saying no, um, you know, then both of us will get a, a notifier on our phone and we can um, solve Figure that it out together. personally. Yeah, yeah? Uh, I like, your, I like your, uh, uh, your point of like looking for um, what has already been kind of deployed quote unquote in the real world. I, I think there's a big difference here, which is scale. Um, yes. Like the, the fact that, you know, if I have a picture, uh, uh, an analog picture of you and me, my ability to distribute that is quite limited compared to having something digital with the internet in front of me. So I think that the additional friction that the analog world, world brings is possibly even useful for, for a lot of these cases. And, and perhaps some stuff um, will need to be tweaked, reinvented for the digital sphere. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with your point in general. And, and uh, again, it takes us back to education and make people aware of what it is that is going on. Yeah. Um, thank you, Tosin. I've, I've got a got a question about uh, user compensation, which is something that uh, I, I believe Poly Poly isn't uh, isn't thinking about right now. Um, so our our approach in uh, with the Fractal protocol is to compensate the users for their data. So first, we offer uh, blockchain token incentives uh, just for them to provide data. There's no sharing in that moment, and then we layer revenue on top of that from an actual buy side. So I wanted to understand from your perspective. Um, um, what are the trade-offs involved in paying users for data, and what, why is that not not an approach that that you're following right now? Mm -hmm. So um, there, so there is a digital income planned, um, uh, but there, uh, it will take a while before we will bring that live. Um, so um, we were we had spent a lot of time thinking about this this mechanism, um, and. Um, if you're paying people for, um, you know, when they are giving access to their data, you are creating an incentive um, for, you know, get naked uh, in some way. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, um, and, um, you know, people who are as privileged as we are, uh, we can say, hey, I don't need these few cents here. Um, uh, I will keep my privacy sphere. Um, <clears throat> but what is with people who are more in a poverty situation? Um, you know, if we are creating now a new um, system for data economy, uh, we should build it from scratch on right uh, with the right incentive mechanisms. So um, what we would like to do instead of paying people for giving access to their data, we would like to pay people for renting out computing power uh, okay. in the context of the data. Um, so because people who are, you know, at least here in Europe, we have the situation that there are uh, people in a poverty situation often, not always, often have a lot of computation power um, because they're spending uh, um, some money for, um, you know, our PlayStations, iPhones, whatsoever. Um, and um, so, and currently um, in Europe, we are spending, uh, that's the last number I heard around about uh, 1 trillion euros um, every three years for our personal hardware. In an oh, average, wow. we are using, yeah, in an average, we are using these hardware 5%. That has 95% of these trillion is an investment which is completely, you know, unused. Idling assets is uh, the word that uh, you know economic people would use for that kind of investment. So um, 
when we are now coming to the situation um, that the uh, computation will be done locally, that uh, in the context of your data, um, but also in the context of your own um, uh, hardware fleet, let me say, because normally we have lots of different devices, you know, um, PlayStations and uh, Xbox and laptop and uh, desktop and iPhone and whatsoever. Um, and, you know, if you're bundling these computing power, this is an unbelievable asset which can really help to make our all our vision happen. Uh, because it's clear, you know, if you want to change the, the economy, that will cost a bunch of money. Um, and so if you can just activate 1% of these um, unused assets, um, that's already a billion. Yeah? Um, and um, so from our point of view, um, saying, hey, we are incentivize um, people for sharing their computing power, normally in the context of their data, uh, but later on also for other things, um, um, is um, a different incentive than saying, hey, you know, you get paid for giving access to your data. Um, and this is more social balance, let's say. Um, and it also um, helps, um, let me make a concrete example. If, if you are an NGO or a university uh, and you want to do some health studies, um, then, um, you know, if you're not a huge, or um, you know, if you're not buyer or something like that, uh, then you don't have deep pockets. No, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, but if they have to, if you are giving access to your data, then these data has to be stored there, and the computation has to be had there. Um, they need system administrators, and these, and these, and these, and these, and that. So, this whole thing is highly risky. Um, for the NGO or for the university. It is very expensive because IT people are very, very expensive. Um, so if you can do that completely on the end user device, um, then um, this is fixing a lot of problems. Uh, and uh, that means as well, maybe people are saying, okay, you don't have to give me money, um, you know, not for my computation power and also not for my data because you're doing something good. Um, and um, on, on the other hand, saying, okay, if now a huge um, pharmacy uh, con uh, company is coming across, they can pay you for you know, uh, the computation power instead of uh, just paying for your, um, your data, yeah. uh, because you, don't, you then don't know what happens with these data at the other side. Got it. And this idea of, of sending the algorithm to to the data, it's um, I, I think it's, it's it's even got other ang angles that are interesting to yes. it, which is if I as a user know that I have my data stored yes. locally, it's with me, it's yes. here, and yes. uh, that it will not move anywhere, it will just run trusted algorithms from parties that I trust. Just yes. it, it just unlocks tremendous value for research, for industry yes. research, research, scientific yes. research, medical research. Yes. Uh, that right now there's just no infrastructure to conduct properly because, as you say, well, you know, yeah. you can send your data, but then what's going to happen to it? Are going to be are they going to be as good as securing it as, as Facebook is? Well, probably yeah. not, and even Facebook has leaks, right? So, yeah, I think and, this, uh, this it, is also a tool for innovation. Nice so, yeah, and it comes with a nice side effect because if the um, um, the computation is done locally, the jurisdiction which is in place is yours. Yeah, um, so. It is not the one in Ireland. No, it is the one on my device. Um, means for me, it will be junk. Yeah? Um, um, and, um, and so on and so forth. So it comes you know, with this turning these things completely upside down. Um, it, it is fixing a lot of problems at once. Um, it is technically not an easy thing to do. Um, also to make sure that the, you know, a user is able to understand what an algorithm will do mm -hmm. um, is not an easy thing to do. Um, but it is a necessary step to do. Um, you know, we, the, the next problem we are just running into um, is discriminating algorithms. Um, and um, um, same thing is, you know, there, there are already lots of incidents in the US um, where an algorithm made a wrong decision. And for whatever reason, um, you know, if something is um, uh, um, visible in the computer, everybody believes it. Um, so, yes. you know, uh, you know 20 years or 100 years ago, it was about, you know, when it's written in the newspaper, then it's true. Uh, nowadays, it is, hey, uh, you know, when it is visible uh, in Salesforce or wherever, then it's true. No, it is definitely not. Um, so, um, 
means um, you know, when a computation is done locally um, and something is going wrong there, then uh, the, the, the guy who had built that algorithm can also give the user the opportunity to give uh, a note with together with the result. So for example, when it comes to, I don't know, let me say um, um, uh, credit scoring. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for it is, you know, when you never had a, a, a loan before, you have quite a bad credit score. Uh, normally, that should be not the case. You know, if you managed your money well, that you were never uh, in the situation to use a loan, hey, you should have the best credit score at all. Um, but because um, the system don't have any data about you, um, you know, you are an unpredictable. Uh, yeah, it hedges uh, a bit. Yes. So, um, in in our case, when the computation is done locally, first of all, it can maybe also use if the users allow uh, um, this um, it can use data um, that is normally are not accessible um, so uh, and secondly the user can also say hey you know that's a result i don't feel well with that um, here's my note about it mm -hmm. if this will be used then or not is a different story um, <clears throat> but you know a, a working uh, market is a market where you have a balanced system so means that the user or the consumer is more or less on eye level with the company. Um, and uh, we currently have a dysfunctional market yeah? because nobody knows really, you know, or only very few people knows what's going on at Facebook, LinkedIn, or um, you know, Google, Amazon, whomever they are. Yeah? Um, and so if we, if, you know, and what Amazon was able to do is converting customers in data suppliers, um, and they even not get paid for that. And you know the word for people who are working for free. Yeah? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and the, the, what what all of us together should do is converting data suppliers to business partners, um, because um, then um, we have an economy um, that will be much more innovative, uh, much more productive uh, for both sides. Yeah, um, and. Um, all of us are just looking at the, um, the data economy, how it works in the US. Um, please be aware that the Chinese model, you know, it, let us not talk about data privacy here in that, that um, aspect, but the data economy in Chinese is much ahead of the American ones. Mm -hmm. They have a, a dual pole, you know, uh, basically Tencent and Alibaba. Um, and their two systems are much higher integrated than what you will ever find in the US. Now there's there are these constant battle between these oligarchs, I would say, um, you know, um, Facebook uh, and and Apple and you know these and these and that. That means the integration of all these different things of you know messengers and these and that and that is horribly bad. Um, and that's something you know if you for for example have a look um, how many turnover you have with digital advertisement in China in comparison to the US. In China, it's around about 25 to 28 percent is just uh, digital advertisement. The rest is digital value-added services. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, it is 99 percent digital advertisement, and everybody is, uh, you know, how borrowed by all these useless advertisements. You know, um, they can be good ones. Don't get me wrong. Um, and um, but um, yeah, we can definitely learn uh, from this aspect of the Chinese data economy. There are other aspects we should definitely avoid. Um, but um, yeah, um, we should learn from uh, all of these different players and just make a better system altogether. Got it, thank you. Um, Tossin, we're kind of running out of time. Do you, do you, can we run over five minutes or should yes, I wrap no up? No problem. Yeah, no, all no, right. it's fine. Uh, I only have uh, two more questions. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you something that might be a tiny bit provocative. I, I don't mean it that way. I'm Please. genuinely curious. So uh, with the facto protocol, uh, data lives on the edge, but its existence is anchored in a blockchain. Um, we're, we're obviously natural big fans, big fans of this technology. Uh, and yes. it's not just about disintermediation and censorship resistance. It's, it's mostly because it provides the bedrock on where you can build a custom economy. And yes. money is a very powerful coordination tool, yes. perhaps the coordination tool. And, and blockchains give us the ability to employ economic strategies to incentivize the right behaviors and, and punish or disincentivize the ones that you know, don't further the goals of the system that you're trying to build. So my understanding is that uh, Poly Poly does not use blockchain technology, but I also hear that you're not the biggest fan yourself. And 
because we feel differently about this, I'd be very interested in, in your point of view, if, if you could share it. Yeah, so as a nerd, uh, <laughs> I love blockchain. Uh, it is an awesome technology. Um, and, you know, it, it was an, an awesome mind who have created that kind of technology. Um, so, but, you know, every kind of technology has scenarios where um, they are useful or not. Um, so, and, you know, we know that sentence about, you know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a screw, yes. uh, like, like a nail. <laughs> um, so, um, it is, I have nothing against blockchain uh, in general. Um, the question is only, does it make sense in this context? Um, so, uh, first of all, um, um, you know, for transactions, um, so for transferring money from A to B, um, blockchain can be a good protocol um, for storing personal data. It's a very Oh, yeah, Sorry no. to say, for, for my point of view, stupid idea. No, we fully um, agree. No, no data is stored on I know, chain. You're handling the data yeah. on chain, <laughs> um, and you're handling then these kind of transaction um, on chain. So um, be aware about the fact that in some countries, so in, in Germany, for example, um, you have to store these kind of transactions 10 years long. And then I can force you to delete them. Um, so, um, <clears throat> there is sogenannte Buchlegungspflichten, uh, that is how it is called in Germany. We have awesome words for things like that. <laughs> um, and, um, and as long as they are in, in charge, um, no user can uh, force you to delete that, this transaction. Um, so, in other countries, that's, by the way, not the case at all. They can immediately force you to delete a transaction, especially when it was canceled. Um, so um, an immutable chain should be then used for something that is really immutable. Mm -hmm. um, and where there cannot be any kind of situation um, where I have to go backwards um, in history uh, and have to vanish something. So that's um, something why I would say, hey, even in these transactional aspect, we should be careful using a blockchain. It would be lovely if we can do so, but I'm not convinced that we are able to. Um, so the second aspect is, especially when it comes to cryptocurrency. As I said, um, from my, our point of view, adding more things that are abstract, that have no uh, equivalent in the real world, um, that makes it diffi more difficult for uh, non-tech people to understand it. It is a questionable idea. Um, um, so, our, um, um, I would say the, the um, so building these kind of incentives uh, inside of Polipuri will take an another few months. Um, so I cannot um, uh, um, explain you in detail how it will work, but I'm more or less 100% sure today that it will happen in Europe and mm -hmm. in nothing else uh, because that's what we, you know money is a, already an abstraction a cryptocurrency is even more abstract um this the, the the next aspect why i don't like cryptocurrencies like they are implemented nowadays hey we are all talking about climate change and you know blockchain and cryptocurrencies are one of the most energy consuming things uh, we can currently build in technology um, so if not absolutely necessary, we should not waste a single um, uh, uh, watt uh, or, or joule or whatever um, on building cryptocurrencies or blockchains. There are parts where they are absolutely necessary and there we should use them. Um, but mining is currently consuming so much energy, it is unbelievable. And, and, and what I found always very frustrating is you know, especially, you know, nerds and all these folks, you know, who are more in the tech scene, they are normally well-educated enough to think about climate change and so on and so forth. Why the hell are we doing things like that um, when we exactly know, yes, you can build these, these number crunching centers close mm -hmm. to our uh, green energy centers, 
but maybe we should build there something really needed. Yeah? So I don't know, uh, um, you know, there are stuff where we need that kind of energy there, and there's no alternative. Um, um, and so why we are using these kind of energy for cryptocurrencies. Understood. And if we do, please one, yeah, not 20 um, and so on and so forth. So that makes me really, yeah, I'm a little bit frustrated about that one, but that's technology. You know, we are all nerds and there is this not invented fear syndrome and my blockchain is cooler than your ones and da, 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 da. So, um, but I'm not in general saying blockchain is a bad idea. No, it is an awesome technology uh, and it should be used for um, some um, cases where it is really useful. So, yeah. you know, for example, Understood. registries and things like that. Um, Tosin, that's a very balanced and, and nuanced view. I actually agree with, with most of your points. The uh, economic concerns is, is one of the reasons why we didn't choose proof of work for our own uh, network. Yeah. And it's it's something that as long as Bitcoin is alive, is likely going to keep being alive. Um, but yeah. um, a lot of folks like us are moving away from that and um, applying yeah. next generation ways of reaching consensus. Yeah. Um, and I definitely agree that <laughs> no personal data should ever live on a blockchain because it doesn't matter how well you encrypt it today, it will be broken yes. tomorrow. Uh, yes. So that is something that you cannot, like optimism driven development yeah. is something that you should not do when you're handling and like if other people yes. are trusting you with what's theirs, yeah. your standard is infinite, right? Like, Yeah, totally agree. It is so funny that especially nerds or, or programmers, you know, we should be careful with words. Um, so invisible means something totally different than unreadable yeah so if yes. something is encrypted um yes it is maybe unreadable but nevertheless you know it is not invisible um and my my private my very private and sensitive stuff they should be invisible yeah not only unreadable they should be also unreadable for others but definitely they should be invisible Understood. Tossin, got one last question for you. If you had just Please. one wish, one wish for the internet industry, what would that be? Oh my God. <laughs> where, um, where to start? How much time do you have? <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, it is when I have just one wish, uh, I really have to be careful. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, start, I have started using the internet long before the World Wide Web came up. Um, and, you know, I'm old enough to, from time to time, wish back this time <laughs> because it was an awesome time. You know, in the 70s, 80s, using the internet uh, was was uh, it was painful, but it was a pleasure. So oh, okay. Um, so um, I would uh, my wish would be that you know to, um, I guess that that is basically also true for software and computers in general. Um, you know, to, to be able to force a computer um, or the internet or, or an app to do what I want to is a cultural technology which is, more, is as important as reading and writing and not like, not like driving a car. Yeah, um, so um, nearly every aspect of our life is nowadays influenced by computers. Um, and what I would wish is um, that we are spending more time on uh, building high quality systems, uh, maybe a little bit slower than today, um, mm -hmm. because quality normally means, uh, needs time and quality means as well that they are as easy um, to handle like a pencil and a piece of paper uh, for, for us nowadays. Um, because otherwise I'm really afraid that we will end up in a, um, horrible situation, not only for us as uh, citizens and human beings, also our economy and our governments will be harmed heavily. Um, you know, there is uh, this awesome talk um, about the programming of tomorrow, it's called, it's uh, about their upcoming software crisis, um, saying it in five or 10 years, uh, we will end up in a huge software crisis because all of our systems get more and more unstable mm -hmm. because we are growing too fast. We are extending them too fast. Um, um, they are not solid enough uh, to carry all these functionalities. Um, and um, my wish would be um, that these young art, and we are very young art as programmers you know, or computer scientists. It's just five decades um, <clears throat> that we are 
getting it dull uh, soon enough um, to, to serve our economy, our citizens um, and ourselves uh, with uh, good software systems. Got it, thank you. Uh, we used to, uh, just as a tiny aside, uh, in our um, uh, in our recruitment briefs uh, that we had for engineering in the past, we used to have a sentence that went something like, you understand that move fast and break things is only a good thing when what you build is inconsequential. And I think that um, at the scale of the people that invented that sentence, uh, it is nowhere near inconsequential anymore. And uh, that is true for many of the large systems that are being built today. We're on the same page there. Um, and in many other places. Tostin, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, I think that we're very aligned and I really like where Poly Poly is going. I'm pretty sure we're gonna be talking again in the future. Thank you so much for your time today and have a really good weekend. Thanks uh, for the invite and uh, um, all the best and good luck for your approach. As I said, you know, as more we are trying out um, and as closer we are working all together, um, you know, as better our chance will be. Thank you very Thanks much. Bye-bye.